provided some term of your lease, like not to disturb the neighbors or, um, I don't know, not to have unauthorized occupants. Those are pretty common breach of lease. Um, mine this morning was you harass the manager. Those are pretty common too. I call it complaining and enforcing your rights, but managers like to say, I'm being harassed. We, we, we differ on that. So uh, the third basic category of complaints is holdover after lawful notice. And what that means is that the, um, the owner gave the tenant a, a notice that says you have to leave at the end of the month, and the tenant did leave. Um, and the last one is unlawful activities. I'm not gonna get too bogged down in this one because it's statutory, it's written in every lease. And it makes these four things illegal for tenants and owners. Um, illegal controlled substances, prostitution, illegal use or possession of a firearm, and allowing stolen property in the unit that was obtained by robbery. If you get one of these cases, come talk to one of us because they're really kind of, they're oddball, so. <laughs> <laughs> They're their own special kind of um, terrible for tenants. So, um, all right, so those are the basic four categories of types of eviction that we have. And then I'm going to turn it over to Kristen to do the nuts and bolts. Yeah, absolutely. And Laura can jump in at any point because she's my supervisor and <laughs> I don't want to screw up. So, not that she, she's very nice. <laughs> No, she is. But um, yes, yeah, so feel free to jump in because we collaborated on all of this stuff together. So, so like Laura had mentioned, the non-payment of rent cases are the majority of cases that we deal with, which makes sense because that's a huge thing that a tenant has to do. They have to pay their rent. Um, so there, there's a couple kind of defenses to. So if a landlord says you didn't pay your rent, a tenant can say yes, but or you know there, there's some other things that can come after. So another big one that we deal with is just habitability. So they can say, okay, but my landlord has failed to make repairs, so I've been withholding some amount of rent because I haven't had you know, the use and enjoyment of living in this property, essentially. That comes up, again, I think a fair amount in cases where people end up having that as a defense. Um, the court generally is pretty good about you know, kind of knowing what to do in that case, but um, in Minnesota, there is that tenant's obligations to pay rent and then the landlord's responsibility to make repairs are dependent on each other, mm -hmm. which is not true everywhere, like Wisconsin. <laughs> <laughs> um, the other thing that we will notice uh, is late fee issues. So by statute, late fees in 504B are capped at 8% of the unpaid portion. This comes up sometimes just because in leases, <coughs> often we see that a landlord has just a flat penalty where they say like it's a hundred dollars or it's whatever, which it, it can't be unless that ends up being you know a pretty small amount. Um, it has to be capped at eight percent, and it has to be what the outstanding amount of rent is. So it can't be your rent portion is a thousand dollars, and that ends up in you know eight percent of that is. It has to be whatever hasn't been paid yet. So that comes up sometimes. Is that 8% annually or monthly? It's 8% of what's outstanding, what's outstanding at that point. So if they're saying like, I haven't paid one month of rent, it would be one month of rent. I guess I might calculate it like a APR or a, it, it's not, sorry. No, no. <laughs> okay. okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, so it just is whatever, I usually just do, right, whatever is they're saying that the unpaid amount is time point zero eight, you know, and that's the. Yeah, so it's not point zero eight divided by 12 times the number of months. No, okay. no. Um, the other thing that comes up sometimes oh, with hey. non-payment of um, rent cases is that if a landlord accepts rent or partial payment, there are certain circumstances where that can constitute waiver. So this can come up, for example, if they're saying like they already filed an eviction and then the landlord accepts money after that. Um, the 504B is really clear that unless your lease says that you can do that, you can't do that. So meaning like if you accept that money, then you're kind of saying, okay, well, I'm gonna let you keep living here. Um, sometimes a lease will have a clause that says like non-waiver clause, um, which says that we can still accept this money and still evict. But if it doesn't say that, it has to basically, it has to be in writing that they are not waiving that right. Um, another issue that we come up with sometimes, I think, uh, tender of rent. So sometimes we have issues where clients say or tenants say, like, but I did try to give them my rent and they wouldn't accept it. And then they filed an eviction. 
Um, so obviously we make the argument that that's really unfair. To say I won't accept your rent and then I'm evicting you for non-payment of rent is really backwards and you shouldn't be able to do that. Um, so we try to have proof in that case to say, okay, well, you know, explain how did you try to tender and go through the facts of what you did at that point. Yeah. Sorry, going back to the first one. Yeah. Is there any kind of proof that the um, tenant has to have asked for the repairs? Like, if, you're, if they're saying, like, oh, this is like the stairs are broken, <laughs> but they've never asked their one Yeah. So at first, I mean, yeah, the short answer, yes. At initial appearances, they don't generally get into it because at first appearances, it just is non-payment of rent, and the person says, I haven't paid rent because of repairs, the referees will usually say, that needs to get sent on for a trial. Like, so yes, it does. I mean, they still have to have requested repairs and you know, repairs that are not the tenant's fault and stuff like that. But at first appearances, the referee doesn't usually get into that. Um, the last thing is about rent receipts, um, just because there is also, again, some of this is gonna be super clear um, in the statute itself. So in 504B 291, it is really explicit about this issue with rent receipts. Just saying that if a tenant comes in and has copies of their rent receipts, that creates a rebuttable presumption that they did pay their rent. So I mean, it's rebuttable. A landlord can say, no, that's not true, and I have proof that that's you know, incorrect. But the statute does provide that there's at least that amount, you know, there's a rebuttable presumption for tenants if they can say, but I actually do have proof that I tendered because why would I be hanging on to these rental receipts or whatever? Yes? Is there a rule about how late somebody can be with rent before they are evicted? No. So if you're late on day one, you can be evicted on day two? Yes. Yep, there's nothing that says, I mean, you could be $5 late and a day late and you could be evicted. You could be five grand late and five months late and be evicted. There's not anything statutorily that says I've that. had both those cases. <laughs> um, <laughs> but the lease might say something. Yeah, the yeah. lease might. Yes, that's true. The lease could definitely, sometimes it'll say like, we won't charge a late fee until X day or we don't file. Sometimes we have especially large or like plaintiff you know, uh, management companies that say, we file on the 10th of every single month for anyone that has an outstanding balance. But that's just their internal policy. I was just wondering with the rent receipts, is that something people typically have, or if they're paying by check, is it just showing that they have like their check stuff or whatever? I would say almost none of our clients pay by check. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so it's either cash or money, or if they have money orders, that's probably the two biggest, do you think? Yeah, so there is a statute that says if you pay by cash, yes. the owner has to give you a receipt. Mm -hmm. Yes. So yep. that's one thing. The other thing is if you have money order that say that you bought the money order and it's for the amount that's of rent and it's in time contemporaneous when that's due, that creates that rebuttable presumption that that was a money order that was given to the landlord. Yeah, the statute itself has a couple different parts to it about saying, right, the total, it comes to the total amount that's due, it's within the time, you know, so that is really, if somebody has a rent receipt issue, it just is really helpful. I still read the actual portion of the statute sometimes to make sure that it has the stuff that they need. So, um, the other thing that we talk about for non-payment of rent cases is that if there is a defense, so some of the things that we just talked about on the other slide, if there's a habitability defense, if there's those things, Sometimes, like Laura had mentioned with service stuff, it can be really nice to use that, tenants use that for leverage, and we do use that for leverage with landlords to say, okay, well, I'm gonna go in there and say this and request a trial or request that this be dismissed, so do you wanna talk now or what? Um, so you do, sometimes you can use that to negotiate, tenants can use that to negotiate. Um, otherwise, if you, know, you can't come to an agreement or the tenant doesn't like the agreements that they're kind of hammered out, you have the ability to request a trial. Because um, again, the referees, the first appearance calendars are usually just a pretty quick, unless there's something really short and dispositive, a lot of times they'll just say, okay, well, a judge can hear that in, in a couple weeks. So we try not to tell people, I mean, you don't have to settle, they don't have to settle for something they don't want, because they do have the ability to request a trial. Yeah. One thing that I forgot to mention is that the referees hear the first appearances, but then the trials get sent up to the civil block judges. Yeah. So those are district court judges that hear the trials. Right, and they do, I think, are pretty good. I mean, a lot of them have housing, you know, here are housing cases, so, um, but it's not the same people. The referees are not the ones that hear the uh, trials. Um, so one thing that does kind of a, another facet of the non-payment of rent cases that comes up sometimes is that if it's just a non-payment of rent case, sometimes the court will ask that the undisputed amount of rent needs to be posted 
posted, meaning like you pay, instead of paying your rent to your landlord, you pay that rent to the court. Um, and that's just because if somebody is saying, no, no, I, <laughs> I would really like a trial on this, and they're you know, four months behind on rent, and it's just about rent, the court kind of wants to make sure that you're not just saying this to buy more time. Yeah, I mean, I had a case recently where the tenant said, I didn't pay January, February, March, April, and May, but I did pay December. <laughs> the court was like, well, you can have a trial about December, but you're going to have to pay January, February, March, and April, May to the court, and she did. Mm -hmm. Um, but so that's kind of the, she admitted that she owed that. Right. And so to get the, yes. the trial on one month, she had that. Yeah, the court is pretty, I would say the referees are pretty good at just trying to deal with the undisputed amount being posted. So if some, somebody is saying like, I have, I know I've paid all but X amount, the court will only make them pay the X, you know, what they're saying, um, the undisputed amount. Um, if it's something where the landlord says you owe me five grand and the tenant says I owe two grand, the court will make them post two grand. You know, the undisputed amount usually is what ends up being posted, not whatever the landlord is alleging is the full amount, which I think is easier for our for tenants because they're saying this is how much I agree that I owe. And and as far as I can tell, there's no continuity on the deadline for posting. No. Each of the referees and judges yes. kind of has a different way they apply it. So. I would advise tenants to ask for the time they need to post because it could give them extra weeks. Someone this morning got till July 6th to post their due rent. August 6th. Yeah. August 6th. <laughs> August 6th. August 6th. No, wait, 2019. No, yes. 2019. <laughs> August 6th. So like, yeah, right. So because he asked and he got it. So. Yeah. yeah, the referees generally do give people time. I, I, I feel like they're pretty good about that. If you're saying, I have this money, but I don't have it on me in cash right now, um, you know, usually I would say they at least get a couple days fairly, and sometimes more than that, so, um, and that is, like I said, so it has to be paid into the courts, so that's the, like, court administration, which is room 170, they will, the tenant gets instructions on this, but just for your own edification, that they actually have to go and pay their rent to a clerk instead of to their landlord. Um, and, and what I just said, so rent sometimes has to be posted <coughs> in repair cases, for the same reason that we said, you know, if you're just trying to say, like, oh, I'm, <laughs> I definitely don't owe this money, and it's because of repairs. Sometimes the court will say, okay, do you think you owe any money? You know, and if people are behind a good chunk, usually there's some amount of money that the referee will make them post. There's a question? Oh, I'm sorry. I was just going to ask, what's the procedure then if the, the, it's not posted by that date? You so lose, we can let so them know. You lose your trial. It's basically like a default. The court okay. will say, you have to post by X date, mm -hmm. and you get an order, actually. The tenants get an order that says, pay, you have to pay this much money to this place by this day. Um, and if you don't do that, it's essentially a default where the court says you lose your trial date and a writ is issued. So that would automatically, the writ Yes, would that be issued. automatically happens. If you don't post, okay. you don't get a trial, you know. And a writ's trial. issued like immediately? Yes. Or, yep. Okay. Yes. That's not a good delay time. No. Right, right, not, right. right. <laughs> <laughs> and then you can't get an expulsion. You can't, I mean, you're kind of, it's, yeah, that's not a great, it's not a great Because it's a default, so. yeah. And that is something we do try to tell tenants, I think, for, uh, for us, because of course we're going to be representing mm -hmm. going forward that, you really, really, you know, you need to be really honest with me about whether you have the ability to pay this. Um, because sometimes you're like, I got it, I got it, I got it, you know, and you're like, hmm, and then they don't post, and that ends up kind of being in a bad situation. So, um, this is something that I just thought might be helpful to see. It's not actually that great up here. But this is what the settlement forms look like in Ramsey County. Um, they are actually triplicate forms, so the top one is white, and you press down hard enough, hopefully, to get through the other two sheets of paper. But I think it's kind of helpful to know, so a lot of times people are just hand writing these at the courthouse. The court at the front, the clerk has you know, about a million of these in a stack. Um, and so tenants can also do that. So if they are wanting to come to an agreement with their landlord, um, this is what they can do. So there's, there's just a portion of stipulated, there's kind of that block where you can add a paragraph. This one is about payment schedules so if they're going to agree to pay. Um, and then there's a few other boxes that are down here that have to do with the writ and expungements and then signature blocks. So you will see these a lot. I just wanted you to see yeah. them. And I'll just point out one yeah. thing that drives me crazy is like a tenant will enter, like I agree to pay this this month and next month and the month after and all the way down to November when this agreement ends. And then it says, if the agreement is not complied with, the writ will issue. Well, if they made all these payments but missed the last one, they're still going to get evicted. Yeah. So yes. any one, any part of this that gets messed up, even by, oh, I got to the office and I was late, but I couldn't get in, I, it's, 
those are mm. really hard yeah. and I, they're kind of a setup yes. for people to fail over a long time in a bad way. So I'll just warn everybody that. Yes, the referees say, and I think I'm, I'm happy that most of them use this language, that you have to, for every single thing that you're agreeing to do, especially for payments, has to be in full and on time. Um, I mean, <laughs> there's sometimes where we argue full kind of, it's mostly com yeah, substantial compliance, but I mean, if you're saying it's gonna be $1,000 by 5 p.m. and it's 9.50 by, you know, the next day, that's that's technically not full compliance. So you yeah, and the other thing to watch out for is sometimes the landlord will, will combine future rent payments into the settlement agreement, and the court really doesn't have jurisdiction to adjudicate anything regarding future rent payments, but if it gets stuck in this agreement, and it doesn't get raised at some point in the future, the landlord could come down and say, well, you didn't, you, you paid this amount of the installment, but you didn't pay my November rent, and this agreement allows me to get a writ. The court shouldn't really let that happen, because the court presently doesn't have jurisdiction over that, but if nobody raises it at that time, nobody looks at it. So I'd really watch for kind of throwing the future rent payments into the payment plan. The tenant needs to know that there will be future rent payments to made, but if they get stuck in this agreement, I think they're even at more risk. And to just try to be really explicit, too, I try to be as explicit as I can, if, even if it's in the little top block that says, this does not include August rent, or whatever, you know, like we try to just be as clear as possible because otherwise you end up in sort of a quagmire in the future. If, it's like, does this include this fee or not? You know, so we try to yeah, so this is a good thing too. It says this case can be expunged. Yes. Yeah, so try to get that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so anytime there's a settlement, you can get, if I do this, this case can be expunged. That's a great, great outcome for our um, So this is also still on the non payment of rent cases because that is the bulk of what you'll be doing. Just as a really general thing in Minnesota, tenants have the right of redemption. So that means basically in non-payment cases, you know, non-payment cases essentially saying you're a demand for rent, you're behind on rent, and that's a problem. Um, and again, tenants have the right to redeem, and redemption means they can pay the, their rent plus the court costs and fees, and the landlord doesn't really have a say whether they want. <laughs> but just for non-payment of rent, if they do those things, they can keep living there. Um, the cost.